Thank you for that introduction. Hello, my name is George Vandendrieshi, and I'm a scientist at Biogen, and I will be co-presenting with Evan Anderson from Tetra Science about how we are harnessing the power of allotrope and moving from data models to data analytics. Next slide, please. So Biogen's analytical, Biogen's analytical strategy, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, George. Okay. I'll declare. Okay, good. So Biogen's analytical data strategy, we, we want to create an automated pipeline that takes the data we're generating from our analytical systems, such as our chromatography systems like Empower, cell counters like the beckman colder Vicel, plate, plate readers, uh, et cetera, combine those outputs with the experimental metadata store that information in a cloud-based environment where all of the information being fed to this environment is under is has been standardized with some data ontologies and data model models undergoes restructuring so all of the outputs come out in a standardized data structure like an ADF we want the the storage needs to adhere to fair data principles so be findable accessible interoperable and reusable we want data, we want vendor independence at, so that we can seamlessly move from storage into data application for our for FDA filing, reporting within internally and externally of the company, and then monitoring the overall usage of our instrument. And these pipelines, we want them to be uh, transparent and traceable as well. Next slide, please. So how we will achieve this strategy is through two key partnerships. Uh, the first partnership is the Allotrope Foundation. So Allotrope is providing standardized data models, data ontologies and schemas, models, um, a file structure through the ADF. And then when you combine all of these steps together, it gives you vendor independence. The next, the next partnership helps us to create those ADF files and access the information stored there. And this is through a partnership with Tetra, uh, collaboration with Tetra Science. So Tetra Science provides an automated data movement pipeline that allows us to go from instrument to a data hub conversion into ADF. Uh, it creates a fair data source, and it gives, we can then access the information using Python tools. Next slide, please. So this strategy is delivered through, through uh, the Allotrope Modeling Working Group. So the modeling working group has adopted a leaf node data model, also known as a tabular data model approach. These data models are faster and easier to create than the traditional full graph approach. Uh, instead of trying to capture every, every instrument output, we are now only focusing on a subset of, a of the instrument data. Importantly, the subset of data that's being focused on is of the utmost importance to our SMEs. So the scientists who are using the information to make business decisions every day. And then these models are able to converge on a consensus terminology or an ontology through a crowdsourced approach, meaning that bio, if Biogen helps to build a data model, we submit the terms we're using. Other companies in Allotrope submit the terminology for the same, same models, and we can align on a central, central system. The, the second part of the delivery is through the Tetra Science data integration platform and the Tetra Science file converter. So our Biogen data sources are, as instrument data is generated, it's fed into a data hub. That data hub then uploads the information into an AWS cloud storage environment, a data lake. Inside the data lake, there are two conversion pipelines that occur. Raw instrument data is converted into an IDS JSON, that IDS uh, intermediate data schema, the IDS JSON is then converted into an ADF file. Once the ADF file is generated, we can perform data analytics using the H5Py Python package. So this is connecting to the underlying HDF5 framework inside an ADF file. Next slide, please. So next, I'd like to dive into a case study around cell counter. The Beckman Coulter Vicel is the cell counter we're using. Uh, and I think this, this case study will echo what Zontel just presented in the previous talk. So Vicels are used, oh, sorry, next slide. Vicels are used to 
count cells using the trypan blue dye exclusion cell counting method. So non-viable cells uptake this blue dye, and from there you can, can, you can generate, you can perform a series of experimental measures. Two of the most common measures used to guide business decisions are the me to measure cell density so that you can monitor your cell culture feed requirements over a 14-day time period, and then to measure the cell viability percentage. This allows you to monitor your cell culture health. Next slide. Our Vicel instruments have two, two file outputs. The first file is a numerical text file that contains two portions. You have your summary portion and then a por data arrays. The summary portion contains information about your, your sample name, the date, and runtime. You have a results section that contains summary averages, aggregated data for all the experimental measurements performed. So this gives you your total cells cell viability, cell density, and then you have a numerical data array portion in this text file that contains all of the raw data collected per image. Additionally, our cell instruments are set to generate 50 cell image files per sample. And importantly, the cell data, the cell numerical data and the image data are stored in separate file formats. So you have a numerical text file and then 50 TIFF images. Next slide, please. And so the Vicel current data state within Biogen, we have for our CCD, who we, cell culture development, who we worked with in this project, they have vi five Vicel instruments. Each Vicel is connected to its own PC for data storage. After an experiment is performed, we have two manual file movement pathways that occur. The top pipeline, we create a summary Excel sheet that collects the most important information for our SMEs, such as viability percentage and cell density. Those Excel summary reports are uploaded into a static storage environment, our environment, our ELE. Inside the ELE, the cell density is plotted for a particular experiment to create cell growth charts. The second data movement pi pipeline is an archiving process. The raw numerical text files and the 50 image files are stored in an archiving network drive. Importantly, these two pipelines occur at different frequencies. The summary, the top pipeline occurs an hour after an experiment is completed. The bottom pipeline only occurs twice a year. And the important takeaway is that this pipeline creates a lot of opportunity, a lot of data risk. So the most important is that anytime you have a manual movement of files, you're at risk to lose those files. Because we have a pipeline that's only reporting a summary of the information, we're losing information, such as the images not being connected to the raw data output. Neither the ELE or the archiving network adhere to fair data principles. And then there's ultimately no traceability in the data. Next slide, please. So we had three three target use cases for our Vicel instruments. The first was to create an automated data movement pipeline. So this means that our Vicel PCs would, as soon as an sample is completed, the experimental data is fed to a data hub, data hub into the cloud environment for file conversion and generation of an ADF. The second use case is that we want to recreate the existing analysis our SMEs are, producing, are using. So that means cell growth charting. So a cell growth chart measures cell density over a 14-day period, and you're monitoring the change of the density. And finally, we want to enhance our data integrity. Instead of generating two file outputs, a numerical text file and 50 image files, we want to use the file framework of an ADF file to house that information together so that when we search for our raw data, we can also find the associated image. And this, can, we will achieve these three use cases through a collaboration with Tetra Science. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to hand the presentation over to Evan Anderson, who will present about how Tetra Science was help, able to deliver on these use cases with the Tetra Science file converter. Thanks, George. Uh, so I'm Evan Anderson. I'm a delivery engineer and solution architect at Tetra Science. Uh, I have my PhD in physiology, so I have uh, experience generating, um, collecting, and analyzing uh, bench data. Um, and so I was really excited to work with George 
uh, on this project for um, facilitating uh, data flow for uh, the Vicel instrument. I'm going to start off by just showing a kind of high level uh, workflow of Tetra Science's solution for automated data movement. A Tetra Science file log agent is installed on the instrument PC. This file log agent watches a specific directory for new raw files. In the case of a Vicel instrument, this raw file is a zip file, which contains a text-based file report and 50 images. When a new zip file is added to this directory, the file log agent pushes this data to a data connector on Tetra Science Data Hub, and this data connector pushes it to a Amazon-based um, Tetra Science Data Lake. When this new zip file is added to the data lake, it triggers a first pipeline, Vicel RAW to IDS. IDS stands for Intermediate Data Schema. It's an intermediate data format, uh, which is a JSON, uh, which we use for going from data sources to various data targets, um, such as uh, visual visualization targets, uh, ELN, as well as other file targets, such as an ADF. When this IDS is produced and is added to the data lake, it triggers the IDS to ADF pipeline, which produces this ADF compatible HDF5 that George was talking about. Once all these files are in the data lake, they're accessible by Tetra Science's REST API uh, by various downstream targets. Uh, in this use case, we're going to talk about um, ingesting this data with interactive Python notebooks, uh, such as Jupyter Notebooks or Colab. Now I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into how these pipelines actually work. So just as a refresher, uh, the raw zip file contains 50 images and one text-based report. When this is added to the data lake, it triggers the raw to IDS JSON pipeline, uh, which unzips this file, saves the raw files uh, onto the data lake and produces an IDS JSON. This intermediate uh, JSON contains metadata from the text report, results from the text report, contains pointers to the image locations in the cloud, uh, and is also has a schema which includes allotrope IRIs from the leaf node model. Once this IDS is added to the data lake, it triggers the IDS to ADF pipeline. This ADF file uh, is created um, in the following way. It has data descriptions added by the Allotrope Java library. It has data cubes added by the Allotrope Java library. And it also has data packages, which we want it to be Python readable. So the data description within data packages contains a turtle file of all the triples. It contains this IDS JSON, and it also contains all 50 images. So we have all experiment data um, standardized in one file. I wanted to briefly show you um, some screenshots of our UI. So like I said, when a zip file is added to our data lake, uh, it triggers this zip to IDS pipeline. And we can see workflows that have triggered previously and a workflow that's in progress on this screen. Once this workflow is completed and we've produced an IDS JSON, the IDS to ADF pipeline is triggered. And once this workflow is finished, we can see resulting files, including the IDS JSON and the ADF in our file viewer uh, for the data lake. From this view, we can get key metadata, such as the file ID, which we can use in our API requests for the file in our interactive Python notebook. So now I'm going to go to those two uh, kind of analysis use cases within Python notebooks. One is growth charting. So for this particular use case, George, uh, provided us with 37 example files um, for which, from which to plot this viable cell density uh, growth chart. The other use case that I'm going to discuss is accessing these key data packages from the ADF in a Python environment. Before I go over to the live demo, I wanted to briefly uh, show you the workflow uh, just for people who aren't super familiar with uh, Python notebooks. So it's a super common uh, data science tool um, with a really, really vibrant um, ecosystem for packages. So uh, the first step is uh, launching your Python notebook. In this case, we're gonna be using Colab. 
We import Python libraries for analysis APIs and such. We make the API call to the data lake um, using Tetra Science API. Uh, we also have the option of using Elasticsearch to query for specific files. And then we do our downstream analysis, such as um, cleaning up the data, turning it into uh, data frames for and aggregating it uh, for downstream analysis and visualization. So now I'm going to flip over to um, this growth charting notebook. So I've actually um, restarted this uh, notebook. So we're starting fresh. And like I said, the first step is to um, import modules. And I've also defined some helper functions for going from, um, from our experiment file to table. Next, we query the data. So George provided this data to us at the beginning of April. Um, and the conversion from to both IDS and ADF happened around then. So the Elasticsearch term that I'm going to be using is I'm going to be looking at all of the data produced by a specific pipeline within a given date range. This just happened to be the beginning of April. For this use case, we're just going to be grabbing that intermediate data schema JSON because the data that we want for a control chart is cell viability versus day. So I'll make that API request right now and we grab the 37 JSONs uh, that were uh, produced in this pipeline at the beginning of April. Now we wanna take the data from these 37 JSONs and turn them into a single table for easy downstream visualization. The first step is mapping some data um, from these JSONs into, uh, into column names. So here I've specified the, the JSON mapping to a column name for run name, run time, and the viable cell density. Now that we have some mappings with um, some helper functions that I wrote, um, we can convert those 37 IDS JSONs into a single data table. Um, a single row corresponds to a single IDS JSON. And, and you can see that we have the data that we care about for creating a control chart. The day of the experiment, the project name, and the viable cell density. And with this data, we can easily reproduce that viable cell density plot. I'm gonna let George get into some takeaways from this pilot. Next, I'm going to demonstrate calling an ADF into a Python environment and reading some of those data packages. So this starts the same way, importing dependencies, um, such as h5pi um, for interacting with HDF, Five files, JSON, um, and also RDF lib for interacting with um, these ontologies. Um, this time, rather than making an Elasticsearch query, um, I know exactly what file ID I'm going to be grabbing here, so I'll just make an API request. This takes a little bit longer because we're grabbing an ADF that has those 50 images uh, present inside it. There we go, and I've turned it into a, a Python readable object. So now I read that object using h5pi. I can look at the top level keys as one would expect, data cubes, data description, and data package are present. And then we can go further into the data packages to find the data description, which contains the turtle file, um, IDS, which contains that intermediate data schema, JSON, and images. Let's check out those uh, triples first. So we can grab the triple file using the correct keys, data package, data description, and the name of the turtle file. And then we can read it using RDF lib. And here I'm just gonna print out the subject, predicate, and object from the ADF um, corresponding to uh, the leaf node model from the working group. So you can see we have our raw data, uh, or we have our data here with the appropriate ontologies. Next, we're gonna check out these images. So if I just look at the number of images in this um, folder, we have those 50 images present. We can just read the first image um, and we can convert it to uh, a nice uh, NumPy array using the Python image library. So here's an example of one of the images that is present in this ADF. Now that we have this image in a Python environment, it makes it really easy to do downstream sophisticated analysis. So just as an example here, um, we can look at the distribution of pixel intensities in this um, image. 
Um, and again, this is taking advantage of the vibrant um, Python community um, using packages like scikit-image and scipy. So here I've created a, um, a histogram of pixel intensity, and this gives us a, a re some really important information with regard to uh, the, the color of the background of the image, which George will also get into later. So here I've demonstrated uh, how we can use Textual Sciences data integration platform, its API, and also um, the uh, cell counter model um, to consume this data in a Python environment. And now I'm gonna hand it off to you, George. Thank you for those demos, Evan. So I would just like to conclude our talk with some high level conclusions that we were able to execute during this project together. Uh, first of all, we were able to implement an automated buy cell data pipeline where we condensed the movement of our buy cell data from two pathways into one. So now all buy cell data as it's generated will go from the data source, the instrument, into a data hub that loads to a cloud environment for that IDS JSON, for that raw to IDS JSON conversion and the IDS JSON to ADF conversion. Next, we were able to re recreate the standard use case for cell counter data, cell growth charting. Uh, our analysis from the cell growth charting revealed to us a key data risk that was occurring within our internal systems. So all of the data that I shared with Tetra Science came from our archiving network drive. Because these networking drives occur twice a year and are a manual process, you have the risk for missing data points. And if you look at the lower right hand side of your screen, our cell growth charts, there are indeed missing days from these studies. So this identifies and confirms a note of potential data risk within our systems. The second thing that we're able to now do with our cell growth charts is we can incorporate metadata into our sample nomenclature. And due to that, we are now aligning on a standardized sample nomenclature for our SMEs to use. That nomenclature will follow a program dash buy cell ID, the buy cell instrument location, dash a GMP date, day of study, and a vessel ID. So we can now incorporate even more metadata into our analysis. Next slide, please. We were, finally, we were able to enhance our data integrity by using that, the ADF file structure to combine the raw numerical text files with the image files together into one format. The ADFs are now stored in a live and searchable Vicel database, which is an improvement over our previous static storage of ELN numerical file, uh, summary files, and the archiving file. It also gives us a single file output, which enhances our data integrity without minimizing any of the information. And because we have access to these image files in a searchable format, we now have opportunities for new analysis such as monitoring the cell contamination. So Evan showed a pixel intensity distribute, ratio distribution from black to white pixels. Well, if you have a contamination occur in your cell culture, that pixel distribution will shift. And we can use those shifts to monitor if a contamination is present instead of having to go image by image and visually inspect the files. Uh, this is something that we're currently moving forward to turn from concept to, to actual practice. Next slide, please. And finally, I'd just like to end with some acknowledgements, thanking the Biogen team, specifically my manager, Len Blackwell, and Brandon Moore, who is our cell counter expert, uh, the Tetra Science team, Spin Wang and Kai Wang for all of their technical help, and of course, Evan for helping to implement all these solutions, and then the Allotrope Foundation members, uh, specifically Matthew Fox and Benjamin Wolford Lim. And we will take any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Great, thanks George, and thanks Evan. Any questions for the Biogen and Tetra Science team? Maybe I have one to, to just sort of get things a little more in depth. With the um, naming convention you were talking about with the cell counting at the end, 
is there a way that you can you know, program that into the systems or are you taking that just directly from file names you know is you know one of the things that i think you know being in the lab we all sort of struggle with a little bit is, is how to connect data into the systems and out of the systems can you talk a little bit about you know you know what the plans are there so the cell counter sample names those occur when the scientist is setting up the vicel experiment um, and so when they're entering their sample for a run, they have, the SME has control over what that sample name is. And previous to the study, what we found is that there, there was a lot of variation in what SMEs were entering. Uh, some, people, some people were very consistent going program name and then a date, but others might go date, program name, or, or something else in between. Some people could use spaces, others might use hyphens. Well, as we start moving into these cloud-based systems and using Python notebook tools, if you use a consistent pattern, you can actually create new data within that name. So the hyphen is very important in that name because that becomes your separator. And so now you can read that sample name, separate those fields out into separate into new data fields that you can use to connect information about your experiment. And, and what we're what we're doing now is our our contact Brandon Moore. He's taking these insights back to to his leadership and to his his team and saying, "Hey, look, if we write our sample names out this way every single time, these are the new types of analysis that we can use to track our samples and locate them and analyze what's going on." Great. Yeah, at some point, right, there's always going to be a human machine interface, right? And at some point, you need to be able to get data out of people's heads and into a into a system. And, and I think that's going to always be the one of the hardest parts in, in doing all of this. So, great. So there, there's one other question. Um, the data shown are final results. Can people do data analysis like in the way it is done in original software? Like, can people play with the raw chromatography data as if doing it in the original Empower software? So this presentation was for a buy sell instrument. So we um, aren't this. So let me back up a step. The vi so just about this talk, the the buy sell instrument performs a trip and blue dye exclusion cell counting method automatically. Uh, we we are not exploring opportunities to perform alternative types of cell counting techniques because that. Tech, that approach performed by the Vicel is a global manufacturing standard. It is an acceptable standard. And to recreate that type of analysis would be, would require a lot of legwork on our end to validate. Uh, because it's a Python environment, yes, you could also, if you incorporate your switch over to chromatography data systems and you were to pull out chromatograms, the raw chromatogram plots, once again, you could start implementing your your peak integrations, peak assignments through a Python-based approach. And there are there are research papers out there about how that's been done. But once again, you'll have that similar problem where the Empower methodology is a glo is an approved global manufacturing process. And anything that you would perform with Python or an alternative tool, you'll have to make sure adheres to that GMP process. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. So, okay. <laughs> great. Thanks for that, George. And thanks again, Evan.